brand new sermon series today. Anybody like football? A little bit? A little bit? There's some kind of big game coming up next week, I understand, right? I know nothing about football. Can somebody tell me if this guy is on offense or defense, this little offense? Because he's got the ball? Okay. I assume. I don't know. <laughs> The comfort zone is our our sermon series. I believe God has something powerful for each and every one of us through this series. You know, every single one of us goes through battles in life. I mentioned a couple of them at the end of worship just now, and those are just the ones that I absolutely know of personal stories of people in this room. Every single one of us goes through battles in life. We may call them something else, struggles, issues, drama, they're battles. We did a whole series on battles a couple of years ago. Some of you will remember. You know, they're battles of the mind. They're battles of the soul, battles of with God. Sometimes we're angry with God. Battles with family, battles with sin, battles with gossip and rumors, with poverty, with abuse, with fame or the lack thereof, right? The list goes on. We never stop battling from the time we're born to the time we die. I know, it's a super positive note to start this series out on, but, but to be honest, that is not what we want, right? We, we do not want the battles in life. It's not what we grew up believing that life would be like, right? I should be happy, right? I should pursue my own happiness. I should find that happy place and just stay there, right? That's the point of life. Isn't that what life's about? As we go through our scripture and sermon today, I want you to hold a picture in your mind. I picture a child who has grown up never having heard the word no, right? A child who doesn't have any limitations on his life whatsoever, like a lack of money or time or a struggle of any kind, no discipline whatsoever, just handed everything he wants from the time that he is born is that a child you want to be around? No, it's not a child you want to be around. And yet, most of us, we would rather go through life as that child. We want God to hand us everything. Everything, right? Everything we've ever wanted. We dream about winning the lottery and seeing all of our problems disappear, right? We dream about the love of our life just walking through the door and whisking us away and doting over everything we say and do because we could never do anything wrong, right? Validating everything, every thought, every fear. Or we wish for a time when everyone in our lives would just see our potential and like hand us a company to run or something because we would obviously do it better without any experience or education, right? We'd obviously do it the right way. (laughs) But I'm starting to understand that even though we want to be that kid, that kid may not be the best thing for us. I'm starting to understand that God doesn't allow us to walk through battles just to teach us trite little things we could learn from a mother goose story, right? He allows battles in our lives to develop us, to develop who we are and, and to show us who he is to move us into a new level of comfort zone, right? If we stay in our little comfort zone, the, the place where we are safe, where we feel good and feel like we're, we're at our best all the time, if we stay there, we're just asking to be that spoiled, rotten brat, the kid who's been handed everything, the person nobody wants to be around. If the world wants to tell you, you have to, you know, get to know who you are, discover you, you do you. Right, but that's only part of the revelation. The rest, in fact, the overwhelming majority is who he is. Who he is. Who he's created you to be. Claiming his promises in our lives doesn't make us spoiled, rotten brats. It reminds us who he is. And I believe we all need some reminding sometimes. We definitely all need to be in training like in sports, right? Right? You practice, you get good at it, you, you learn a playbook. There's not just one play for every situation, is there? You have to learn a number of them. That's what this series 
is all about. Filling our playbooks with some moves, some plays, what to do when you're out of your comfort zone. Because honestly, we are so often out of our comfort zone in life, right? Did anyone else get to like be an adult and think, why don't I have more of this like figured out by now? Like <laughs> the adults when I was a kid seemed like they had everything together. They had it all figured out. And here I am well into adulthood having none of it figured out. We need a playbook. And God gives it to us. It's right there in the word. Every battle, every grief, every hurt, every fear, every worry, every financial struggle, every parenting debate, every leadership question, every test of faith, we need a playbook. When we find ourselves in a tight spot, who do we turn to? What do we do? Is there like a one play fits all situation? I can just get rich quick, get skinny quick. Like is there some scheme? No, there isn't. (laughs) Sorry to burst your bubble on that. I I can see that throughout the word. But we can prepare for when things get scary. We we can prepare when for when things feel messed up and, and out of control. We can prepare for those things. Today, we're going to learn a play from the book of Second Chronicles. Actually, this is this one, this first one of the series, is really more of a preparation technique. Because if if you can learn this one. You may not even have to play. (laughs) If you can learn this one, you may not even have to fight a battle, okay? Throughout the Old Testament, God's people went through a lot of battles. We've been talking about some of them over the past couple of weeks. They went through a lot of battles, and they lost a lot of battles. Today, we're going to read about a battle that they won, (laughs) And I want you to know that going into this. Like, usually we don't get to the ending until the end of the story. But I want you to know the ending of the story going into this. This is a battle that they won. This is a story about how God's people won an impossible battle by stepping outside their comfort zone. And I think along the way we'll learn a couple of ways that we can win, too. Okay? Turn to Second Chronicles 20 with me now. This is a long story. It's a long chapter. There are lots of long, crazy names, okay? Lots of places and moving parts and whatever. I'm going to get through this the best that I can and sum up as much as I can for you. Um, First of all, it starts off, this is the context. The king of Judah at the time of our story was a man named Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Jehoshaphat. Now, actually, I think it's Jehoshaphat, but I can never get that word in my head. So Jehoshaphat. Overall, he was a good king, Jehoshaphat. He believed in the Lord. He got rid of most of the idols in the nation, and he generally followed God with a couple small exceptions. He was a generally good king. Now, some armies from the surrounding areas declared war. I want you to notice before you even get into this that surrounding armies declaring war is not always an act of God because of punishment. It's not always an act of God because of punishment. We get this twisted sometimes because, honestly, we we live in a world that is just messed up. It is sinful, right? Since Adam and Eve messed up, it's been messed up. Sometimes surrounding armies just declare war, and it's not a punishment. But God does allow it, and we're going to see why. So a messenger comes, and he tells King Jehoshaphat, look, they are close. They're they're closing in. There are armies coming, okay? Verse 2, sorry, 3 of 2 Chronicles 20. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. He's terrified by this news, and he begs the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Right off the bat, he does a couple of things correctly, right? We can see that pretty clearly. He did a number of things right off the bat. He immediately, he hears the news, he's terrified, and immediately begs the Lord for guidance. I have to admit, I wish the Lord were always 100% of the time my first go-to, but I don't know why I forget sometimes, right? Right? Like, I go to everyone else 
before God sometimes. God's my last resort. And then I'm like, duh, I have not even prayed about this yet. I've asked everybody in my life, but I haven't prayed about it yet. What am I thinking, right? Jehoshaphat doesn't do that. He goes immediately to God. And then he gets in front of the people. Verse 6, he prays, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. Listen carefully to his words here, the language that he uses. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. And now, see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless, powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. A few things that this guy does right, right? and you can see it so clearly in this prayer. They're all very clearly laid out. And again, we know the end of the story. They won this impossible battle. So we know he did a couple of things right, okay? The first thing that he did well was he took a position. He took a position. Now, it's not a physical position yet, right? He took a spiritual position. First, and foremost, because we don't always win battles in the physical, we win them in the spiritual, right? Before we have to march out to battle, we win them in the spiritual. He goes straight to the source. Now, throughout the Bible, we can see various characters who are confronted with something terrible or do something terrible. They go right to the source. For example, Mary, We just talked about a couple weeks ago. She was a woman of worship. We know that because as soon as she's told she has to do something crazy and incredibly tough, countercultural, just it's going to bring shame on her own family through no fault of her own, right? Not because she deserved it. She worshiped God immediately. She sings a song to the Lord immediately. That's who she was. That's what naturally came out of her. She was a woman of worship long before that angel came because that's what came out of her. In this moment, Jehoshaphat gets bad news, earth-shattering news, and he runs straight to God. Who you run to in times of crisis says a lot about your relationship with God. He acknowledges the problem, but he also acknowledges the source the source of deliverance, the source of power, the source of victory. It's not himself as king. It's not his armies. It's not his weapons. It's not the the amount of people he can amass. It's God. It's God. Take your positions. Now he begs the Lord for guidance and he asks everyone to fast. Now when we encounter a problem, we usually go to all the wrong places. Right? We drink it away. We um, entertain it away, you know, hide in a Netflix binge, or we, you know, go to all the friends who we know are going to give us the advice that we want to hear, not necessarily the advice that we probably need to hear, right? Or we just hide and we cry into our pillows. We, we hope it will go away. Maybe if we could acknowledge the problem, and acknowledge the source immediately before doing any of that, maybe it would turn out differently. Now, as I was studying this this week, I kept going back to God. If you knew you were going to deliver them, and these armies weren't marching against them for any fault of their own, right? This wasn't a punishment like so many of the other battles throughout the Old Testament, 
why even let the army that close? Right? Why not take them out without the Israelites having to be scared? Without them having to struggle and march out? Why, why wouldn't you deliver them without their knowledge? You know, protect them. And they don't even have to worry. But again, God kept bringing me back to that spoiled, rotten brat. Without the presence of conflict in our lives, do we end up really being great people? Without the presence of conflict in our lives, what good are we? A a child who gets everything he ever wants, no limitations, do you want to be around that kid? When you see that attitude from the outside, you want nothing to do with it, right? It's ugly, it's selfish, it's repulsive. But secretly, I'm always wishing my problems would just go away magically. I, instead of walking through them, acknowledging the problem, acknowledging the source, giving it all to God, I just, oh God, just take it. Please, just take it. I don't want to have to deal with it. I'm scared. But we sometimes need those night seasons, too, those battle seasons, too. Night, night's good for stuff. <laughs> it's good to appreciate the day. Sometimes we need to, to grieve, to withdraw from people. Jesus did that. We see throughout his ministry, he withdrew from people from time to time. He grieved. He talked to his father. He was away from people in small amounts. We need those seasons, too. God knows that. And so here, Jehoshaphat, he sets the tone. He models the position for his people that they were going to take. By the way, we talked about our families last week. You do this for your family. I don't care if you're the head of the household, the man, the woman, the kids. No matter who you are, you can model this and lead your family in this. It's more powerful for parents, obviously. You can model this for your family. Take a position, a worshipful, prayerful position for your family. Lead them in that. Sometimes I can't always be the strong one, right? I need somebody else to model that for me to help me through it, to help me see it from a different perspective. Jehoshaphat, as king, he did that for his people. He modeled it. But he wasn't the only part of this story. In fact, the nation had to get behind him on it, I believe, in order to march out and to win. So we see all the men of Judah standing before the Lord with their little ones and their wives in verse 13. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there now, I've researched this guy. I don't think he was um, anybody necessarily in leadership or of importance, or I think it was just a guy standing there. His name was Jehaziel. Uh, And verse 15, he said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through a valley, verse 17, but you will not even need to fight. Take your positions. If I don't have to fight, why do I have to go out and take a position? Anybody else a little salty about that? Like, I don't want to have to go through all the work of taking a position. God, just can you just handle it, right? Can you just, can you just do this for me? But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Verse 18, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. This guy was humble. He was the king, and yet he let just any old guy from the crowd speak to him that way, like tell him what to do, right? And then he immediately bows low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Verse 20, early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. 
There's more here that he does in the face of pure terror, in the face of sure death. Like there are for sure three armies against one here. There are three armies marching against them. They are for sure going to die without God's help. Right? Three armies against one is not great odds. And we could all come up against battles like this in life where I'm not making it through this. God, I... I'm looking at this thing and I have no answers. Like I'm not getting through this financial struggle. I'm not, my marriage is not going to make it through this. My kids are never going to, like something has to give. I'm not making it through. He literally says we are powerless against them. Powerless. And yet... He stops here, not to prepare everyone, not to say, you know, you guys, you better sharpen your swords. You know, we need a game plan, a strategy. He stops to worship God. Worship is powerful. Worship doesn't have to be all of this, right? The the band, the lights, the music. It doesn't have to be all this. We are blessed to have it. And sometimes it's easy to say, well, you know, I worship in my car. I'm, I'm always worshiping in the kitchen as I prepare meals. And yeah, okay, me too. But that moment that I had standing in the back there today doesn't often happen in my kitchen or in my car. That moment of corporate worship when we're all standing together. And I have all these stories of beautiful stories of God's freedom in all of your lives. And I, I, we're worshiping together. There's something so powerful in that. When we gather together as the church, we were meant to be. And, and are we really purely focused on God in the car? Purely focused on him in the kitchen? Right? When, when we're gathered like this, it's sort of socially unacceptable to also be on your phone or <laughs> attention on something else, right? There is, it, there's something magical, not magical, supernatural and powerful Holy Spirit moment that happens here. Right? These moments in corporate worship here in this room, I think we rarely get those moments outside of this room. And we're forced to think about our creator, our morality, our life, a being higher than ourselves. That's where the power is. Not necessarily in these four walls, but when we gather together, where we most often get our hearts set back on him and off of us. Most often, for me, happens here. I need it every single week because by the end of six days, I I got my eyes off again, right? I need this reset every single week. I think they needed this here. It was one thing to gather in the town square, but here they are gathered on the way to a battle together in unity, worshiping the Lord. Something so powerful about that. He prayed and he worshiped. He took the position, but then he continued to pray and to worship. You know, worship, again, not always just the songs, right? The, the raising our hands, the closing our eyes and focusing. It's, it's worship is often just declaring who God is. I teach this a lot because we need reminders a lot. Praise and thanksgiving are two different things, all powerful, all good disciplines, but worship is just focusing yourself on who he is not on us, not what he's done for me. That's Thanksgiving, right? That's good. You should thank God for what he's done for you. Absolutely. We talked about the power of gratitude last week, but worship is something else. And I honestly, I think it's the thing we least do out of worship, praise, and Thanksgiving. We thank God for things he's given us a lot. We praise him for what he's done. Worship is just purely about who he is. He does this here. I don't know if you caught it, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms and of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Did you hear any Jehoshaphat in that? Any Israel in that? What you've done for us or thank you for, for doing what you do. It was about who he is, the God of our ancestors, the ruler of all kingdoms and earth. He is powerful and mighty. No one can stand against him. Worship is a heart posture more than it is a physical thing. It's posturing our heart towards him. It's understanding who he is. He wasn't complaining or lamenting the the smallness of his army or how unequipped he was. He wasn't even thanking God for the miraculous 
interventions that had happened in the past. He was just declaring who he is. He is the provider, the deliverer, the comforter, the healer. I say these things during almost every, every time I open for worship for a reason, to get our hearts on who he is. It's essentially me quoting the names of God back to him. Like Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. He is my provider. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our banner. What we follow into battle, he is our deliverer, essentially. Jehovah Shalom means the God, the Lord sends peace. He is my comforter. He sends peace. Right? Jehovah Rapha means the God who heals. He is the healer. When I understand that he is the healer, I know to go to him for healing. I know he's going to heal me. He is the healer. That's who he is. It's not just something he does for me. He did for me. He does for other people. It's who he is. It's how he chose somewhere in the Old Testament to be recognized. He gave us a name. It's who he is. He is also the way, the truth, the life. Jehovah Ra'ah means the Lord is my way or my shepherd. He guides us. He is the way. Uh, Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord is our righteousness. He is the, the light. He makes things clear, right? Black and white, selfishness, unselfishness, right? That's who he is. If you would like a list of these, they're in the sermon notes. Jehovah Shammah means the Lord is our light, ever present, always with us, will never forsake us showing us the way. Isaiah 9, 6 says, he is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. These are things I know about who he is, so I declare them back to him. It's who he is. When I understand who he is, my problems don't seem so big anymore. He is the God that counts all the stars in the sky. He knows them by name. You know how many stars there are in the sky? We're discovering them, new ones, all the time. He knows them all by name. He knows the amount of hair on each of your heads. Pull one out. He knows it. Like, how? Right? That, that seems so big. So much bigger than me. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts higher than my thoughts. That's why I go to him. Because he gives me a new perspective all the time. Things I never considered because he's so much higher, so much bigger. When we get our eyes off of us and onto him, something powerful happens. It's powerful. We're reminding him of his promises and past victories. Right? Jehoshaphat goes on, Oh God, did you not drive out those enemies before? And did you not give us this land forever? Right? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, Whenever we're faced with calamity, like war, plague, famine, we come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. He's reminding him of what he's done in the past as well. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. Now, what has God done for you in the past? A lot of times I think we get what we want like a kid on Christmas Day and it immediately goes out the window like the next day we're done playing with it. In one ear and out the other. We don't acknowledge what he's done for us. And then so the next battle that comes, we forget. Or when we acknowledge what he's done in the past, of course he's going to do it again. He did it back there and that was impossible. He healed me before. Of course he's going to do it again. He restored a relationship before. He can, he can do it again. He's not going to abandon you because he didn't do it before. Jehoshaphat knew who God was, is. But he also knew his own limitations. He acknowledged his own limitations, his own helplessness. It's another thing that he actually did Right. All right. In verse 12, he says, oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. Do you know how much humility that takes for a leader, a king, to stand in front of all his people on the way to battle and say, we don't know what to do? I have no idea what I'm doing, guys. Here we go. That takes incredible amounts of humility for a king. And I think of all the verses that we memorize in the Bible, 
Now, we always memorize the, like, God's going to turn it into good verses, or he has a plan for my life verses, or, you know, the, the victorious ones. Maybe we need to learn this one sometimes. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. We don't know what to do, but we know the guy that does. We know the guy that does. It's one of those verses I think we should actually say more often. Some Christians actually demonize acknowledging reality. Like, don't say that. Don't, don't speak that into existence. Like, you would not believe how many times while Aaron was going through kidney failure, <laughs> people would come up to me, good, well-meaning Christians, like good people, would come up to me and say, how's Aaron? And you know what? He's not doing so great. Like, that's just, that's honest. And they'd say, oh, don't say that. Lady, you asked. Like, <laughs> you asked. You want me to lie to you? I don't know what the right answer is here. He's not doing great. Like, I, I would get rebuked for saying the truth. It's, it's the truth. That's the reality I see right now. I'm not saying faith can't be higher than that. I'm just saying I don't know what to do, but I know the guy that does. It's okay to say. I, I can acknowledge my own helplessness. He is not good. He's not been healed yet, but I still know the healer. The source hasn't given me what I need yet, but I still know he's the source. In fact, what we constantly said throughout that was God is still God, and God is still good. If this doesn't look good. We got a negative report from the doctor. Aaron's getting worse. He's in pain, but God is still God, and God is still good. God is still God, and God is still good. I don't know why we're going through this right now. Now, I don't have, I don't have all the answers, and two years later, October will be three years since kidney transplant, right? We're on the other side of it. I, I can see a couple of things that God was doing in us now. But then I didn't know. We were in pain. I just acknowledge it's not good. I am powerless against this. We're in a situation we might not make it out of if God doesn't intervene. He might die. We are 100% totally in God's hands. That's all I can say. That's not faith to say. It's not not faith to say. I am powerless against this, but I know who to go to. I know who my source is. I don't know what to do, but I'm seeking God every day, looking for help. In our brokenness, he is strong. Pretending I'm strong doesn't make him strong. In my brokenness, he is strong. 2 Corinthians 12 says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses, for the power of Christ can work through me. Have you ever been glad to boast about your weaknesses? Truly? As American, I don't know if it's our culture or what, but we tend to, everything's good. Yeah, I'm busy, but things are good. Right? The Instagram is all full of good things. It's pretty. Boasting about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. This is Paul writing this, and he went through a lot of them. A lot of persecutions, a lot of troubles. He suffered for Christ because when he was weak, then God was strong. When I am weak then I am strong. Jehoshaphat knew that he was powerless in the face of the enemy, but also knew the guy who had the power. And he wasn't afraid to admit it. Look, I often talk about having an honest relationship with God, right? We, we so often want to pretend. We so often want to be perfect before we come to him. But God wants to be involved in those conversations. He wants you to come to him angry. He wants you to come to him depressed, he wants you to come to him scared and anxious and afraid. He wants you to come to him like that because he wants you to come to him always. In every conversation, he wants to be in them. And he's not scared of your anger, your doubt, your fear. You can't hurt him. Do you ever think about that? You can do nothing to hurt God. He's unhurtable. Is that a word? 
You can't do it. Even in your anger, your doubt, your fear, when you're honest, he can speak. When you're humble like Jehoshaphat, he can do something. Our miracle, let me think about this. I don't think I've ever seen a miracle that was in something that you were already strong in, right? Your miracle is always in what's left, like what you're weak in, what you're broken in. It's in what's left. Jehoshaphat didn't have a big enough army, but he didn't need one because he had a big enough God. Didn't have a big enough army. He didn't need one. And if we can stop grieving what we don't have and start focusing on what we do have, that's where God can work. I don't have enough money. I don't know how I'm going to get through the situation, but I know the God that has all the money. And I don't have enough stamina to get through this. I don't have enough wisdom to make these decisions, but I know the God who does. Because nothing can separate you from the love of the Father except you. Nothing. Nothing on planet Earth can separate you from the love of the Father. If you feel distance from him, it's not him. Reach out. Talk to him. Have that honest conversation. Right? Even Job, the guy who maybe arguably had it worst in the Bible. Right? Even Job, he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. I mean, how much faith trust does it take to say that? He lost his family, his riches, his health, everything. He lost it. The Lord gave me what I had, and you know what? The Lord had the right to take it away. Praise the name of the Lord. I didn't earn it. I didn't earn peace on every side. I I didn't earn the leadership position that he gave me. I, I didn't earn my health even. It was given to me. Praise the name of the Lord. Listen, when you praise the name of the Lord, chains break, things change, freedom is given, hope is instilled. When you praise the name of the Lord, things change. Our attitude about life changes in the physical. We win battles in the spiritual. He changed his position. He he focused himself. He praised and he worshiped. He took his position, but he also obeyed and marched toward certain death. He obeyed, and he marched, even though it looked like, for sure, death. If you're honest with yourself, would you have that kind of faith? God hadn't delivered them yet at this point in the story. All they've done so far is received terrible news. There are three armies coming. They prayed, they fasted, and then they marched. There was no break yet. Right? Nothing changed yet in the physical. Okay? He obeyed and he marched. Verse 20. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped. He said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. He had no shot of winning at this point. And yet he got up early and led his army. I just, I was, I mean, I sat down this week. God, would I have that kind of faith to lead straight into what looks like pure failure? To lead even when you haven't promised me anything yet, really? You haven't given me a whole lot. I mean, there were some words from God, but would that be enough for me, honestly, with these tests? Sometimes they're hard. They aren't just to prove something to God, but to prove something to us as well. The first time I ever preached this passage, Aaron was a few months before kidney transplant. And I, I was, as I was preparing for this this week, I was remembering just how bad it was. I mean, we had no shot of getting through that. And yet, he still showed up every single week on the stage to lead us in worship. He never stopped. He was days from death. He wasn't going to let his body, no matter how painful it was, and it was, right? 
He wasn't going to let it dictate whether or not he lived out his calling. For those two years, if he wasn't in the hospital, he was here on Sunday mornings. He led the team. He led the church. Some of you remember this? Yeah. Inspiring. Powerful. Can I brag on my husband just a little bit? <laughs> I, mentally, inside, he's preparing himself to die. He talks about this now sometimes, like getting himself ready for what that means. And we were fully submitted to God, functioning in our callings and, and doing everything God asked us to do. But still, like, God, if, if this is what you're going to do. <sighs> no, we're not taking it lying down, not giving into it not getting bitter and angry at God. God is still God, and God is still good. We're going to worship and lead others to do the same, right, up until the very end. It's our same, same stance with ministry and church, really. God wants to make this succeed. It's his to do that with. If not, we'll, we'll be obedient until the end, right? And there were times during COVID when it looked like the end, y'all. I'm just saying. He took an offensive stance, Aaron, Jehoshaphat, <laughs> an offensive stance, already victorious, even though it looked impossible. Second Corinthians 4 says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. So my situation, the reality is that I am hard pressed, I am perplexed, I am persecuted, and I am struck down. But the revelation is that I am not crushed. I am not in despair. I am not abandoned, and I am not destroyed. When we get our eyes off of that revelation, all we're left with is the reality. And yeah, that's scary. It's hard. It's not enough. But fortunately, God has given us more. He sees more. And we get our eyes off instead of looking to him and, and up to his ways and up to his thoughts, which are so much higher than ours. And we get our eyes on the problem, on the hardship, on the battle, down in the muck. We get in these cycles of, of shame and guilt. It's not easy there. It's not easy anywhere, really, but when we get our eyes back on Jesus, he fights the battle for us. He fights the battle for us. When everyone was telling Jesus, Lazarus is dead, Jesus saw him as only sleeping. When everyone was telling Jesus, there's a little girl in the upper room, she's dead, Jesus said, nah, she's sleeping, right? When everyone's telling Jesus, we have no food, Jesus says, but what do you have? Right, when everyone was telling Jesus the wine is gone, he said, bet. Did I use that right, Gen Z? Yes. When everyone is telling Jesus there's soldiers coming, he says, I know. This is a necessary battle. This is a necessary loss because God is doing something bigger than you could ever imagine right now. Let me just give a disclaimer here. This... This is why I have an issue when sometimes Christians take these particular passages, these passages of victory, out of context. It's why they sometimes say, don't say that you're hurting right now. Like, don't speak that into existence. Don't acknowledge reality. It's why we have to bring every scripture back under the authority of Christ and within the context of the whole of scripture. God doesn't only give victory for victory's sake. Sometimes... What we perceive as a loss isn't a loss at all. It's a processing of our character or a delivering a later victory that is so much bigger. Lazarus's family in the New Testament, he perceived his, they perceived his death as a loss. Jesus saw it as an opportunity to begin his final walk toward the cross. That is the event that catapulted everything that happened next. Jesus saw him as only sleeping. His ways are so much higher than our ways. Jesus' disciples saw the cross as an unbearable loss. I couldn't fathom. But Jesus, 
saw it as the beginning of your salvation, yours and mine, and my kids, and my kids' kids, my grandparents, and the generations before and after me. He saw all of it on that cross. He didn't see it as a loss, but an unimaginable victory, which is why when we take our positions, it's a heart position, not a physical position. Because in the physical, it doesn't always look good. And it's why I can't always give you like a a blanket play. Like, here's what we do. No matter what, I can't give you that speech. Because if your heart is only for victory, for the here and now, God might give it to you. But if your heart is surrendered toward him and whatever he wants to do, toward obedience, then sometimes it may seem like you lose here and now, but you'll win in the long term. Does that make sense? Are you following me here? Uh, we prayed for years, two years for Aaron's healing. We couldn't see what God was actually doing. If God had healed him a month in, would we have learned the lessons that we needed to learn along the way? We, we couldn't see what he was doing. And I wonder if Jehoshaphat was in this he was in this mode where he was panicking a little bit. Like, here they are marching toward death, yeah. army behind him. Yeah. He gave his little pep talk, but it just <laughs> wasn't enough. Right? He's struggling. Like, we are all on the way towards victory. God, I need you to come through. Right? I wonder if he began to panic a little here. He's been so faithful so far, but that fear is tough to overcome. And he's leading the charge. He's marching towards certain death, but he needs something to rally the troops, something to encourage his own soul. (sighs) Verse 21. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. And at the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. Another one we should probably memorize. At the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. The Lord caused the armies to start fighting among themselves. No, no, no one else is excited about this? At the very moment. (sighs) Do not be afraid. God said, do not be afraid. They sang in the face of fear. They sang in the face of certain death. They sang. They marched themselves to that battle, and they sang. Up until, the, up until this point, a lot of this had been the king's doing, right? The, Jehoshaphat bowed low. He got everybody fasting and praying. He went to the Lord immediately for guidance. But the singing couldn't have done that alone. They sang in the face of a mighty army eager to destroy them. They sang in the face of seasoned warriors, hearts set on death and plunder. Right? They sang even though reality did not yet match God's word. They marched toward it. Their march could have been a trail of tears and, and fear, a funeral march to their deaths. But because they trusted the Lord, it was a march of victory. They sang, and God responded immediately. They sang themselves into the valley of blessing. Psalm 108 is what I read at the beginning of our worship service today, right? It is David in a similar situation expressing his heart to God. Listen to it again. My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises with all my heart. Wake up, liar and harp. I will wake the dawn with my song. You know what waking the dawn means? It means you're desperate enough to stay up all night worshiping the God of Israel, singing and declaring his praises. You wake the dawn, claiming his promises and calling in that which does not yet exist. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations for your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. Now rescue your beloved people. 
Answer and save us by your power. Look, in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. face of my oppressors sing in the face of injustice and rumors and abuse and insults I choose to sing and not only to sing but to wake the dawn with my song instead of going to bed at night down in the dumps ready to quit life and just hoping it'll be somehow magically better in the morning I'm gonna go to bed tonight saying you know what my sun sets to rise again that dawn is gonna know what hit it I'm not flailing around in the dark anymore. I have the light. The word of God is like a lamp under my feet, right? He's a light to my path. I know who I am, and I know whose I am. I am a daughter of the king. So go ahead, enemy. Come at me, bro, because if the Lord is with me, who can be against me? Do your worst, right? Verse 23, the armies of Moab, the first army, the army of Ammon, the second army, turned against their allies, the third army, Mount Seir, and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began to attack each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as the eye could see. Not a single one of them escaped. Not a single one. So they go out and they gather the plunder. It took them three days to get it all. They named that place the Valley of Blessing for obvious reasons. Verse 27, then all the men returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem and they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. See where they went first when they got their victory. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Rest. God gave them rest on every side. Jehoshaphat was not the provider of rest or peace for his people. God was. Jehoshaphat turned their attention away from him when it mattered. It's just hard for a leader, a mother, a father, a boss to do because we feel that pressure so much. But he turned it against himself, away from himself, and put it back on God. That's why we got to memorize verse 17. But you will not even need to fight. Didn't that come true? Didn't he do it? Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. God is for us. Who can be against us? God was doing something so much bigger for Israel, not just giving them peace for this one battle, but for a long time on every side. It's why they ended up having to go. God did that. There was no other way for them to win, but God doing that. Are you comfortable taking those positions all the time? Heck no. Like God pushes me out of my comfort zone all the time. I, I was very comfortable leading kids' ministry for six years. Just FYI. So very, I would have done that for the rest of my life. I loved kids' ministry. God didn't let me. He kept pushing me past my comfort zone. I was also very comfortable operating in the background. If I could have any job in the church, it would be a service producer, which you probably don't even know exists. That's where I want to be right? Pulling, calling the shots in the back, (laughs) down on stage. I was incredibly uncomfortable here at first. And the band can go ahead and make their way up here. I still am sometimes. But I'm learning firsthand the reality of the statement that evangelist Aaron Holt says all the time. He says, there's no growth in the comfort zone. There's no comfort in the growth zone. I don't want to stay stuck in the fear that I grew up with. I'm not going back there. But I have to keep moving forward. I have to keep trusting God. I have to keep worshiping and praying and submitting to him. 
when I do, it might be scary at first, but he will see me through. Take your positions. You won't even have to fight. This is how we fight our battles. We're getting ready to sing again. And this time, I, I hope that you won't just go through the motions, just sing whatever's on the screen, but really sing. Sing your heart out to him. Declare who he is, what he's done in the past. Thank him for what he's done for you. Declare who he is. Because this isn't just a one-time I can't worship God today and still feel it tomorrow usually. In fact, probably an hour after I leave those doors that I begin to like come down, I'm feeling all my problems again, right? I was so encouraged when I left. <sighs> and then life again, right? You gotta worship God continually. Pray constantly. Stay in his presence. His presence isn't just here in this room. It goes with you. You have to stay in that mindset. We can't, we can't just pray in the temple in the safe place like Jehoshaphat did. We also have to pray as we march. Pray as we go into battle. Pray as it, it looks really bad. We pray, we sing, we declare who he is. That is how we fight our battles. We take our positions. Do not, do not be afraid. The Lord, your God, is with you. Father, today we worship you. We set our hearts on you. Before we do that and we sing our hearts out one last time, we humble ourselves before you first. We thank you for everything you have done, acknowledging that nothing we have is ours. It was all given to us. I didn't earn anything that I have. Any good thing comes from you. I just humble myself in your presence. God, I acknowledge that you are my source, the provider, the deliverer, the comforter, the healer, the way, the truth, and the life, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You are all of those things and so much more. So big. So much higher. You have different perspectives. You see things so much differently than I do. So God, I come to you. I know I don't have the answers. I'm looking to you for help humble myself before you. With heads bowed and eyes still closed, today some of you are saying, I've never done this before. I've never humbled myself before him. I've never given my heart to Jesus. Asked him to come into my life, change me from the inside out. I don't want to leave today without giving you that opportunity because it's so easy. Jesus came to make it easy. It may not be an easy decision, but it's so simple to say, Jesus, come forgive me. Help me. I know I can't do this on my own. I'm going to start looking to you for help from today forward. If that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, we call it saying, I'm in. I'm in to following Jesus. I'm in for his forgiveness, for his love, for a sense of freedom and hope again. I'm in that's you. You want to say, I'm in today. Would you just raise your hand if you're here in the room? I'm in. I want to follow Jesus. If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen or type it in the comments. I'm in. Keep those hands up for just a moment. The ushers I just want to give you a little card explaining that decision, helping you through that a little bit with some next steps. But maybe today you've made that decision a while ago, right? But you have let the fear get in the way of worshiping him. Maybe you've just gotten lazy or you've gotten out of the habit or something else has gotten in the way. There, there's an addiction. There's um, a selfishness somewhere. Maybe you're just you've been too prideful to say that you need him, that you don't have all the answers. Look, this, this sermon series is about pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone, but not just for discomfort's sake, for the sake of moving towards God, for the sake of meeting him where he wants to take you. He, he loves you right where you are, but he's not going to leave you there. He wants to challenge you, to grow you, to move you into your calling. 
And in the last series in Unqualified, we learned that he can use so much more than we think he can. He can use our fear, our, our anger, right? He can use all of it. But he's not going to leave you there. This series is about pushing you out of that place. Using your gifts and talents to follow God like never before. Going on an adventure with him. Doing things you never thought you would do in service of the king. Okay, so today we're going to worship one last time. And I just want to challenge you just as a practice, as a um, way to begin this process. I want to challenge you to do something outside of your comfort zone to worship God today.